According to the website study.com, simony is the buying and selling of either something of a spiritual nature or an object with a spiritual role, such as a church office. The term simony comes from a biblical character, a guy named Simon Magnus. And we can see Simon's story in the book of Acts chapter 8. And I actually, I have my, my Bible right here. In the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 18, it says, When Simon saw the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also the ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So this is basically what they call in India, bakshish. Bakshish is a term for bribery. And we know that it, within the Catholic Church, as well as other religions, there is this bribery, this simony that happens for positions of power. Now on this channel, we have done a deep dive into a lot of different houses, a lot of different families, including the Valois of France, the Bourbons of France, the all the royal families of England and the Romanoffs. Well, now my friends, we're going to talk about some of the Catholic popes. The popes I wanted to really focus on are the Borgias, but I can't get into the Borgias until I get into the Pope that preceded Rodrigo Borgia. Even in the official narrative, this Pope is considered to be one of the most tyrannical Popes that ever ruled over the Catholic diocese. This Pope has a history of drinking a particular bodily fluid, actually two particular bodily fluids, and potentially being someone who practiced Satanism. But before we get into this, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. It also helps us immensely. If you enjoy this episode or find this episode entertaining, please, 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 if you find it in your heart, share this video because that helps us with all of the restrictions that we this particular channel is given on YouTube. But I also want to give a special shout out to, of course, our patrons and our producers. This channel is solely funded by the viewers. And so without our Patreons and our producers and our sponsors, this channel would simply not exist. So a huge thank you and shout out to all the people who fund this research and fund this channel. If you would like to donate to Esoteric Atlanta or become a part of our Patreon and or our producer community, there's a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today we're going to be looking at Pope Innocent VIII. Pope Innocent VIII was born Giovanni Battista in Genoa, Italy in 1432. Little Giovanni was born into a very, very rich and noble family. With that being said, because of his family's affluent status within the community, little Giovanni was able to receive a very prestigious education. Now, something about this time in the 15th century is that the church and the state were not separate. Now, for us here in America, it is part of our American culture that our church and our state are supposed to be separate with the religious freedom for everyone to believe whatever they want to believe and not have it affect our governments. And it's stories like this that is why our forefathers made sure that the church and the state are indeed separate. Now, the 15th century, we're coming up to the Protestant Revolution. And right before the precipice of the Protestant Revolution, we see extreme corruption within the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is still extremely corrupt, as well as all the other Protestant churches do. So I'm not calling out the Catholics. It's just this story is a Catholic story. They're all corrupt. But we know that the corruption of the Catholic Church was one of the inspirations for the Protestant Revolution. 
Well, the Catholic Church, again, was not separate from any of the government structures of Europe. In fact, at this point in the 15th century, most of Europe, let me take that back, all of Europe was ruled by monarchies. Now, we think that the king is the top dog. He's like the main honcho of a country. However, at this time period, the Pope trumped the king. So the Pope himself acted as an emperor. It was like all the kings had to submit to the Pope. So the Catholic Church itself held a lot, a lot of power. And because the church was heavily involved with government, the power it held over the people wasn't just their salvation. It also had to do with their daily lives. Now, again, because little Giovanni, soon to be Pope Innocent VIII, was born into an affluent family, they were able to get him into elite edu academic education, which also involved, of course, the church. Basically, the church and the politicians are one and the same during this time. Terrifying, I tell you, terrifying. So the person that you believe controls your information for the afterlife, and since we all kind of fear death, we become vulnerable to those people who claim to have the answers, but they also control what happens to you in this life too. Now, because Giovanni's family was very affluent and he was able to get a top-notch education, he was given the role of cleric at the archdiocese in Capua. Now, I, again, most of you know, I did not grow up Catholic. I grew up Presbyterian. I grew up Protestant. And even though, again, the Protestant churches are very much a business too, I don't know much about the structure of the Catholic church. And so I, I did a little digging into what a cleric does in the Catholic church in these archdioceses. Because in my mind, a cleric is like a secretary. But something in my gut was like, I don't think that's what Giovanni was doing. I don't think he was being a secretary. No, you guys, especially here in the 15th century, a cleric was a priest. So at a very young age when he was still technically a juvenile this guy Giovanni this rich kid was given the power of being the priest and these clerics these priests not only did their priesting but they were also the ones who were assigned to study the sacred text and deliver that information to the people which is super sketchy I think we can all agree that that's very sketchy. And we know that there's a lot of shenanigans that go on with that, seeing that the Catholic Church itself and the Vatican Library to this day still holds a library full of information that the general public has not seen. Now, again, at this time period in the 15th century, a lot of people, a lot of the common commoners, the peasants, did not know how to read or write. They also did not understand Latin. At this point, Latin had become a dead language. It's still considered a dead language. And so these particular rich kids who received extreme like exquisite educations who learned latin and learned these things had the privilege of, of of having these educations at a very young age were then handed the authority and the power to study the sacred text in order to then tell the people about the sacred text which Again, super sketchy. We know that's uh, that opens the door to manipulation and lies and deceit because it's not an equal balance of exchange. We also know that clerics were the ones who performed rituals. And I'm not talking about just like the conspiratorial rituals. I'm talking about like weddings, funerals, all the types of stuff that happen in, in churches or archdioceses. Now, the interesting thing about Capua, where Giovanni at a very young age was sent to do this, to have all this power, was in a town called Campania, Italy. So the Archdiocese of Capua was in Campania, Italy. And I did a little digging into this particular Archdiocese because, again, this is kind of According to the official narrative of history, this is the seat of Christianity. So, you know, nothing is a coincidence. And what I found very interesting is that this particular archdiocese, according to the official narrative, was founded by a man who allegedly was the disciple or the student of Peter, Peter from the Bible. 
This was a man named Priscus who is now considered Saint Priscus. And what's also interesting is that even though this Priscus dude was allegedly Peter's student, it is believed that the quote unquote last supper that Jesus had before he, you know, was unalived was held at Priscus's house. Super interesting. Um, now, this is ironic to me because, as many of you guys know, uh, I my channel got big going through the missing books of the Bible, the ones that we have access to. And it's pretty evident. Well, we know the Bible has been edited multiple times. We know that that's historic fact. You can look and see it's like over 50 times or something the Bible's been changed. The stories have been changed. Jesus wasn't his name. Like there's tons of stuff that have been corrected and changed and the stories evolved. They, the church has taken creative liberty with these stories. And um, the missing books of the Bible that we do have access to tell a very different story. One of which is that Peter was not the disciple that Jesus claimed to build his church upon. The rock that he built. That's not in the missing books of the Bible. In fact, Peter is probably one of the most problematic disciples that Jesus had. I mean, dude was a total narcissist. If you really, even in the Bible we have today, that's been edited. If you really read, really look at Peter, Peter was a psychopath. Like he was not a good dude. And it's interesting to me that the Catholic church, the, or the, the church itself, and these, these councils, change the story to make Peter the main dude, especially since Peter is such a narcissist, which is very psychotic, where in the missing books of the Bible, we know that Jesus left everything to Magdalene and his brother, James, which makes more sense, right? Like you would leave your estate to your wife and your brother. You, you wouldn't leave it to some random problematic student. But the reason why I bring this up is because the Catholic Church is so corrupt. And the fact that the Catholic Church and all churches, I believe, know where they're lying because of the manip manipulation, because of these ideas of clerics being the only ones to actually study the sacred text, because they know that. I think they're kind of like laughing at us because they put Peter as the head guy of this newfound religion. Anyway. Just my speculation and just my take on it. So the fact that Giovanni, the the Pope that would go on to be notoriously known throughout history as a tyrant and as more of a sat satanic priest, got his start in an archdiocese that had direct connections to the narcissist Peter. After a while, Giovanni ended up leaving the Archdiocese of Capua and making his way down to Rome to seek more power, better positions within the church. Now, something I want to point out at this point, and this, this side of the story is going to be really important when we talk about the Borgias as well. Now, I have been to Rome. I love Italy. My brother-in-law's mother's family is from Italy, so my nephew, nephews and nieces are like a quarter Italian. My sister had to learn how to make a lot of Italian dishes when she married my brother-in-law. So I, I have a very a soft spot in my heart for Italy. And of course, Rome is magnificent. I've been to the Vatican, even though it's kind of creepy, the Vatican, it's also very beautiful. There's also something very um, breathtaking about being in the Sistine Chapel and being within this history, right? You know, darkness aside, it is a historical place. So I think sometimes when we think about Rome, Italy, Roma, Italy, Today, we see it through the lens of our present day eyes. But Rome at this point in the 15th century was a backwaters, lawless town. Just in my mind, when I've studied it, it reminds me kind of of like the wild, wild west of the United States. There was a lot of shenanigans going on. There was a lot of pop. There was a huge divide between the peasants and the people who worked for the Catholic Church, the the nobles and the wealthy families. And so the peasants were kind of at the mercy 
of these really wealthy tyrannical priests. I mean, we're talking about like it just it just was not the Rome that we we have today. And again, it wasn't even like a bustling city. It was more like a backwater small town. And so to move to Rome, especially somebody like Giovanni Battista, this this rich kid from Genoa, Italy, this this super rich kid who was working his way up with his family's money and his privileged education as he's working his way up to the Catholic Church. The only reason why he's going to go to Rome is for the Catholic Church. There's no other reason. It's like me just upping upping and deciding to move to some small ass town where there's nothing to do and people don't even respect the law. Like you wouldn't do that unless you had a reason for that. And so I, I hope that kind of sets the scene. So what's happening outside of the church in Rome kind of mirrors the corruption that's happening within the within the Catholic Church. Although within the Catholic Church, it's pretty and refined. It's kind of wild within the peasantry. So nonetheless, Giovanni makes his way to Rome. In 1473, at 41 years old, Giovanni is given the red hat of Cardinal. Now this was under Pope Sixtus IV. And as he's given his red hat of Cardinal, now Giovanni, not only is he like a rich kid from an affluent noble family of Italy, but he is now part of the inner circle, the elite of the Catholic Church, which isn't just, again, the elite of the Catholic Church, but this is the nucleus of power for all over Europe. In 1484, Pope Sixtus IV passes away. At this point, Giovanni was 52 years old, and the 32 cardinals for which he was a part of were now responsible for finding a new pope. Now, according to the folklore of most religions, when they're not just the Catholic Church, when they're picking a new leader, it's supposed to be God inspired. It's not. It's based off of bribery, off of conspiracy. It is a very cleverly laid out chess game. And at the point of the death of Sixtus, we see this seminary, this 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 box sheesh, this bribery big time start to happen as different cardinals start to throw their hat in literally the red hat in to be the next pope. And so in order to really understand how Giovanni became the next pope, we have to really get into the politics of Europe because, I mean, kings were involved, different sanctions were involved, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this was a, a dog-eat-dog -dog scenario where, where people were really battling it out for who would now take the reins and become the literal leader of the Western world in religion and in politics. Rodrigo Borgia, who we're going to talk about next, and uh, Giovanni Battista were always bumping heads. They were kind of, uh, you know, they were contemporaries. They were peers, but they were kind of with different factions. And one of the reasons why, the, the one of the reasons that we're really going to focus on, because I thought, wow, what, what scandal is this that I stumbled upon? One of the reasons why Giovanni won the seat or got the seat of Pope was because of the barons of Naples. At this point, Naples was ruled by King Ferdinand I of Naples. Now, King Ferdinand, as well as Rodrigo Borgia, was born in Spain. And King Ferdinand's father, a man named Alfonso, had come to Italy to take control of Naples. And so if we kind of mirror that with our own situation in our own world today, the people of Naples were pissed because these people from Spain, from a totally different country, had come into Italy and taken control of Naples. So like the locals, not just the peasants, but the barons, the upper crust were like, whoa, 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 dude, you're not even Italian. It would be like an illegal immigrant coming into your country and then taking over the role of prime minister or president. So I can absolutely understand why the people of Naples were 
very upset about this situation. Now, King Ferdinand I, what a... Um, I don't know who this dude thought he was, but talk about a tyrant. And just because, and this is where we have to be careful in this world. We, we know that Pope Innocent VIII was Giovanni Battista was most likely a Satanist. We know that. And he was going up against King Ferdinand I, the barons backing Giovanni as the Pope, because remember, the Pope trumps the king. So if the barons can back Giovanni, if he makes a promise to them that he'll get rid of Pope Ferdinand I, then that, that's the back backroom deal, right? That's the, the box sheesh. Well, if we know that Pope Innocent VIII is the Satanist, we might just logically think, well, then Ferdinand I must be the good guys. And I keep saying this over and over and over again. No, they're both bad guys. There, there's no honor amongst thieves. The bad guys are going to throw each other under the bus all the time. Ferdinand I was wicked. Now, Ferdinand I is also historically known to be a tyrant. But it's not just his tyrannical rule that's concerning. It is concerning, but it's not the most concerning. The most concerning thing about Ferdinand I was his black museum y'all what this dude this dude would do he would have his enemies so when his enemies were either unalived in a in a battle or were unalived intentionally not in battle just to get them out of the way he would have their bodies brought to him and have their bodies stuffed and embalmed and he would set the bodies up in this part of his house he called the Black Museum so that any person that dared question him or try to challenge him, he would just give them a tour of the Black Museum where they could see the faces of people from their time, from their friends and their compadres, see them stuffed and in this museum as a spectacle, like not, not even buried, not even like the catacombs, like literally stuff like an animal, he would have them sitting at tables like they're having a meal together, just a total mockery. So King Ferdinand I, I don't blame the barons for going into a bakshish, a bribery type of deal with Giovanni Battista, because this is terrifying. Not only is it going to piss you off that a foreigner has come in and now is ruling your part of your country, but this foreign ruler is batshit crazy and is embalming people. So I don't blame the barons for doing what they had to do. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That type of situation, even though Pope Innocent VIII was not super, no pun intended, but wasn't innocent himself, it was like, I guess, from their perspective for their daily lives, he was the lesser of two evils. So it was, so it was through that support of the barons that Giovanni Battista became Pope Innocent VIII. And he was, I, I don't know how you would say it, crowned anointed Pope on the 29th of August, 1484. In 1489, Pope Innocent VIII made good on his promise to the barons and he excommunicated King Ferdinand I of Naples. So that's a pretty big deal. So it's not like you arrest somebody because remember, again, you guys, the kings, the monarchies are subservient to the Pope. So simply by excommunicating King Ferdinand I, he took a lot of a, a power away from Ferdinand. Then he invited... Which is super concerning, too, because I think one of the main problems, the barons, again, did not want a foreign person ruling their homeland. But after he, Pope Innocent VIII, excommunicated Ferdinand I, he invited King Charles VIII of France to invade Naples and take Naples for himself. Now, we've covered Catherine de Medici and other French houses like the Valois and the Bourbon House. And we know that France specifically had a very tight relationship with, with the Vatican. 
Um, we know that a lot of times the the French kings would would do business with the Pope, backdoor deals. Again, I will place Catherine de Medici's video down in the description box. We go more into that. She was Italian and she was married and from a banking family in Italy and married into the Valois family line. She was also a practicing Satanist. Um, and so it's interesting that we see this in the 15th century, this, this starting of this special relationship that the Vatican has with the French monarchy. So anyway, Pope Innocent VIII gets rid of Ferdinand I by excommunicating him and then invites King Charles VIII of France to come into Italy and invade Naples to take Naples for itself. Naples in Italy is is agriculturally is a very prosperous land so it's a very valuable piece of land for the economy of any country so it makes sense why this piece of land would be fought over by a lot of foreign entities but I guarantee you the barons even though they were probably happy to not have Ferdinand around they probably did not see that coming did not see that this pope that they got they literally helped to get into the papacy basically betrayed them by inviting another foreign entity to come in and invade their homeland for its for its land, for its soil. Another kind of shady thing in the beginning that Pope Innocent VIII did, he very much ran his, his platform where he wanted to engage in another crusade against the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire at this time is also problematic for the western europeans the western europeans are problematic for the ottoman empire it's the victors of history who tell the story this was around the type the time of vlad the impaler over in what is now romania i'll tag that story we, we've covered vlad before so i'll tag that story down below as well if you missed it so the ottoman empire is definitely a force to be reckoned with and so Pope Innocent VIII, before he became Pope, was telling the people, promising them, we're going to have another crusade. We're going to go up against the Ottoman Empire, up against the Turks. But, my friends, what ended up happening when he became Pope is that he started to take bribes from the Ottoman Empire. So he started to do back backdoor deals with the, per the group of people that are supposed to be the enemy of the European. One of the common traits we see historically with these psychotic leaders is kind of this projection of their own violence and their own nefarious actions on the people that they call witches. And so Pope Innocent VIII, along with a German churchmen named Hendrik Kramer were instrumental in starting what would become known as the witch trials, so the first round of the witch trials. Hendrik Kramer was born around 1430 and died in 1505. Many of the historians have described Hendrik Kramer as a superstitious psychopath. Hendrik Kramer was adamant that anything bad that happened in his Germanic territory, including weather, was due to the nefarious magic of some of the peasants that he labeled as witches and warlocks. Now, again, we covered a story that very much mirrors this, which is the story of King James I, the guy who wrote the King James Bible with the Freemasons. Now, when we're looking at the witch trials, I believe that these were the people that were simply from Tartaria. But but if we take conspiracy out of it, if we take the alternative timeline out of it, we're mo more than likely looking at lay people, at peasants who basically used herbs to heal people. It was the 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 the, the form of medicine at that time. We're also looking at a way to bring fear and terror into a country so that people become more subservient to the government. Like if you do what we say, we're not going to torture you. So Heinrich Kramer, he wanted to have all these witch trials. He was bloodlust. He was bloodthirsty. He wanted to start torturing people, especially women, legally. And so he had been trying for a while to get the legal compensation to do these witch trials. And it wasn't until 
he were arranged um, a document with Pope Innocent VIII that he legally was then able to start torturing people. The papal document that Pope Innocent VIII endorsed, used to endorse Heinrich Kramer's practices and beliefs and his uh, witch trials, ended up taking the life of about 40,000 people. Pope Innocent VIII was also heavily involved in the slave trade. There's another word for that in today's society, and it starts with a T. I can't say that word on YouTube, but basically the Catholic Church is still doing this today. I mean, so is the Protestant Church, so so is many organizations. But nonetheless, he was heavily involved in the slave trade, especially for black people, Moors, which were dark-skinned black people. And he would even gift different monarchs who were in his favor. He would gift them slaves. For example, he sent Ferdinand of Spain, not, not the one of Naples, but the one of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabel, that king. He sent him a gift, gift once of a hundred slaves. So not this guy is not, not a good guy at all, at all. Like most of the popes, Pope Innocent VIII had a slew of illegitimate children. Of course, they're not allowed to get married, but they were very openly having relationships with women, which to me is not that big of a deal. That's not, you know, every life matters in my opinion. So the fact that Pope Innocent VIII had children is not the concerning thing, but I wanted to just go ahead. I'm not even going to get into his children, but I wanted to go ahead and bring that up because that's going to play heavily into Rodrigo Borgia when we get into the Borgia family, because we're going to do a huge deep dive into the Borgia family starting next week. But he did have a lot of illegitimate children. And in 1492, Pope Innocent VIII had a stroke. And this was kind of the downfall of of Pope Innocent VIII. When Pope Innocent, after, post the stroke, Pope Innocent VIII was bedridden. He started to develop really bad fevers. He got very, very thin. It was very apparent that he was about to pass away. Now, Pope Innocent VIII was desperate to stay alive. Desperate. And so there were two methods that Pope Innocent VIII on his deathbed tried to do in order to sustain his life. He tried to drink the breast milk of nursing mothers. And he also, have to be careful about how I say this, guys. Historians call this a, uh, a basically a blood transfusion. That this was a mo uh, an ancient, not ancient, but, you know, historical blood transfusion. He picked two innocent 10-year-old little boys. I have to be careful how I say this. And removed the red liquid from these two 10-year-olds' bodies. Obviously, the 10-year-old little boys were unalived in this process, but he drank the red liquid, the red medicine, medicine as he saw it, in order to bring himself back to life. It, it didn't work. He, he, he himself also was unalived. And even though historians, and this is just me speculating with my conspiracy hat on, even though historians believe that this was the first time he had done this, that he was desperate to stay alive. And so this was kind of, they, they kind of brushed this off as a transfusion, as an, as an old type, type of way to transfuse yourself. I just, in my suspicious mind, I think he had been doing this all along. I think they all had been doing this all along. They knew the benef the benefits of, of taking this substance, this red substance from an innocent person, for an example, a child, having it spiked with adrenaline to bring on the fountain of youth, if that makes sense. I'm just trying to be very careful how I say this. I don't, again, my opinion, totally my opinion, not fact. I don't think this was his first rodeo when it came to taking this red medicine, we'll say. For lack of a better word, please, you guys, do not put the word in the comment section. Please do not do that because that will potentially hurt my channel, like take all, 
just be, please be careful. I think you guys understand what I'm saying. Please be careful. If you discuss this in the comment section, please be careful about how you're discuss discussing this because this is a super taboo, super taboo. Um, and I don't think that the powers that be want me or you speculating about the um, gravity and the amount of times in which the popes, plural, had partaken in this form of medicine will say. I think they want us to believe that it was strictly something that was done on Pope Innocent VIII's deathbed in an attempt to save his life because in the negative polarity, they view some lives as more important than other lives. And um, we don't believe that in the light. We believe all lives are equal, that human life should be valued, and your own red stuff should be staying in your own body. You can do transfusions, but they don't. Transfusions today don't unalive the person donating the blood. They, there's a way to do this in a proper way that's not harmful to the per the donor. Um, we also know that if this was, in my opinion, we don't know, in my opinion, the reason why he picked, like if you're going to, if you know that this process of trying to save your life is going to end up taking the life of somebody else. Now, again, I don't think anybody should be doing this, obviously, but why would you pick two innocent 10 year old boys? Why wouldn't you pick like a prisoner who had, you know, unalived a bunch of, uh, why not take Ferdinand the first? Why not? Why go for two innocent young boys? Is it because of the purity of children? Is it because you're able to scare children before you actually take it from them? That's just where my mind goes, you know? So anyway, I think, I think most of you watching this know what I'm talking about. Again, if you're new to the channel and you're new to this concept, there's so many videos on the concept of using the red stuff that's in our bodies for our youth, for beauty. It's the fountain of youth. It's there's all there's so much information out there about that. Not here on this platform. You have to go to other platforms. But anyway, that's just my speculation. I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys probably kind of speculate the same thing too. But nonetheless, he did go. He left his body, and then the next pope was Rodrigo Borgia. And y'all, the Borgias are one of the most scandalous and fascinating families, I believe, to ever walk through our history books. We're talking a daughter who has the who had the reputation of poisoning people. We're also going to talk about Jesus and Cesare Borgia, and what that means for us in our modern times, my friends, the Borgias. Listen, a few years back, Showtime did a whole series on the Borgias. And if your family is covered by HBO or Showtime, you know that you come from a pretty scandalous family. So I'm really excited. I feel like the Borgias have been a long time coming. We've referenced the Borgias. I've referenced the Borgia from time to time in other deep dives that I've done, especially Cesare Borgia and the Jesus painting, all that kind of stuff. We've talked about that a lot. So I feel like this has been a long time coming for us to really do a big deep dive into the Borgias. Now, obviously, this video, I did not go as deeply into this video um, about this deep dive into Innocent the Eighth, as I am going to be going into about the Borgias, but I kind of wanted to use this deep dive as a way to set the scene for what was actually going on in the Vatican when Rodrigo Borgia took the papacy, like what his predecessor was doing so that we get into the scandals of the Borgias. We understand that these scandals did not come out of nowhere. This was normal for Rome, Italy at this time, these the shenanigans. So anyway, you guys, please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. As always, again, a huge thank you to our patrons and our producers. You guys are rock stars. You guys have no idea how much you've helped me. I know sometimes people have this misconception that those of us on YouTube make a ton of money. We don't. I, I don't, at least. I don't. I was laughing with somebody else behind the scenes you know and there's a lot of quote-unquote truthers out there who have made millions and i'm like yeah it's because they're lying to people they're clickbaiting people 
I try to tell the truth. And anytime my opinion changes or I realize that I've made a mistake in my research, I try to talk about it. I don't take videos down. I leave all my videos up. Even if my opinion is changed, I still leave them up because I want to be transparent with you guys. I'm on this journey with you as well. There's no information that I have that you guys don't have. And opinions are allowed to be changed. And because I do tell the truth, I get hurt financially. All right, I've almost gone bankrupt doing this. And so long story short, I thank you guys so much for the people who have signed up for the Patreon um, and, and donate each month to this channel. You guys really, really help me out a lot because it takes a lot to do these videos. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And I thank you so much for, for understanding that and for helping me do this so that we can look at these subjects. I can do the heavy lifting and we can look at these subjects and talk about these subjects in this community. I also am so grateful to all of our sponsors, ASEA as well as Spooky2. Um, the ASEA links are down in the description box below. Spooky2, if you would like to get a Spooky2 Rife machine, you can enter my name, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N, at checkout for 5% off of your purchase. All of that is down in the description box as well. Links to the websites, all that kind of stuff, as well as, as videos that I've referenced or subjects I've referenced in this particular episode. Down under show notes, you'll see links to like Catherine Day Medici, like all the past um, videos and deep dives I've done that I just currently researched in this video. You can see those links down there as well. And once again, I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful day. It's so great to be back in my little bedroom doing these videos. I was off for a couple of weeks um, dealing with some stuff that I will talk to you guys about very soon when I can talk about it. So anyway, you guys join us on Aquarius Rising Africa this Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to be talking again about uh, Pope Innocent VIII live, a live discussion with Shanti from Aquarius, my friend Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa. I love doing these discussions with Shanti because if you guys, a lot of you also are follow her as well. Please, If you're not subscribed to Aquarius Rising Africa, please make sure you get subscribed. Those links are down below too because Shanti, that girl, my friend Shanti, she literally, she goes deep into a lot of these like practices and she has a lot of whistleblowers that come on her channel. And so it's always fascinating to review this information, my research again with Shanti, because she's able to pick up on certain patterns in these stories that maybe I don't see that help us understand these stories even deeper, especially with these nefarious people from our past. Also, because it's live, we have an incredible audience. We have the same, the regulars that come every Monday and participate in the live chat with us. So you at that point will be able to have a live conversation about your thoughts and your opinions on this particular subject. So please make sure if you can join us this upcoming Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern time over on Aquarius Rising Africa. Again, that channel will also be tagged down in the description box below. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye, everybody.